No viewers yet. All right. Eh, that's fine. Let's go ahead and clean some of this up. And honestly, get this stuff going. Twitch boosting on the stream store online is Twitch boosting my Twitch Twitter. That's fun. Hey, it looks like I got one viewer on. Do I? Let's see. Who's in the chat? Positivity bot. <laughs> Uh, how's it going for everybody in the chat um, and everybody who's going to see this later on when I upload it to YouTube? Um, I've got a couple things going on uh, this evening. Uh, my name's Duo. I do uh, 3D printing. I do electronics projects, uh, radio control stuff, all sorts of neat little electronics, computers, 3D printing hobbies. Um, tonight I've got my 3D printer running. It's making some uh, game pieces actually for a friend, um, some board game pieces, uh, Star Trek theme. I kind of geeked out those on Thingiverse. And um, while that's printing, I've actually got this board set here. And this is an actual video card for an 8 bit computer. 
and the, the 8-bit computer is an RC 2014 style C80 based computer. Let's see if I can get this up on camera there. Let's see if I can get to focus. Uh, this board is based on the uh, TI TMS 9918 video, um, which a lot of the older early 80s 8-bit computers had. And uh, I've got actually a larger project with uh, the actual backplane and the CPU board and the memory board. Um, and I'll pull those out in just a little while. But this is a video card add-on. I just got this actually in the mail. And I'm um, going to go ahead and go through the assembly tonight. I've got my, uh, my Hakko iron, which uh, I need to get actually get that warmed up. And we'll go through the assembly. It's uh, essentially, I'm going to start off by uh, filling in all the IC sockets that are up here uh, and actually the small components before those. Um, or maybe we'll do the small components after uh, and get them all soldered in, solder in the edge connector that actually connects to the bus of the RC2018. Um, there's crystal, there's actually a video out, it's a composite video out. And that connects right onto the end, the end of the board. And that'll get soldered in right there at the end. And let's see, let's see if I can bring up the website for this thing. Team D, RC2014. Yeah, that's 90, 90, 90, 90. Let's just go straight to Tindy then. T-I-N-D-I-E. Tindy.com. Uh, let's see, The, let me get the documentation up here and just review that. Uh, let's see if I can actually show this on OBS or not. Uh, well, that's kind of showing up. So yeah, RC 9918, which is uh, it's an art video card based on the 9918A for the RC 24 RC 2014 Z80 based computer. Uh, the TMS 9918A uh, was used in the TI 994A computer, the MSX computer, the ColecoVision, the original Sega SG1000. Um, and later on, they actually made better revisions of the 9918, uh, like the 9938, the 9958. I actually have a 9958. Uh, I believe those were used in the MSX2, um, and it's a much larger chip. It is a it is a beast of a chip, but uh, that came as part of a, 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 ch a kit of chips for an MSX build, um, and that might be sometime later in the future. So, let me get my iron fired up here. It's okay. And I'll double check the 3D printer. Print looks good. It's actually going nice and slow. And I want to print out some nice pieces for my friend. He's actually going to uh, get them all painted nice and, uh, nice and neat. So let's see if I can find those up here. Universe, uh, Star Trek board game. Is this the one? No, nope, wrong kit. Of 
course, I don't have a link on my streaming machine. And I just have the files downloaded. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, that'll run. Um, all right, so I'm going to go over the board here. Um, yeah, I guess we'll get the sockets put in and we'll start off with the large socket U3, which is a big 40 pin that the uh, 9918, 9918 chip will go into. Hope the audio is catching fine. My uh, my actual nice microphone, my lap mic actually failed for some reason, which is really annoying because I really like that microphone and now I gotta order another one. Get some fresh solder on the tip there. Wake that up a little bit. And I'm going to start by soldering down one pin of the socket, the corner pin. That'll hold everything in place. And I'll solder the opposite corner just to get the socket kind of held down. And then we'll just go through and just start soldering up each of the pins. Heat pin up, apply a little bit of solder, next. Heat pin up, apply a little bit of solder, next. Heat pin up, apply a little bit of solder. That's a pretty easy, repetitive process. Seems like my airflow today is backwards. Air should be flowing away from me. Do not inhale, viewers. And I still have zero viewers on Twitch. That's okay. If anybody wants to hang out, they can definitely come hang out. It is Maker Faire New York weekend, so there are quite a few people that are either preparing for that or are already there and partying since it's uh, the first night, Friday night. First real night of the fair, I think. Maybe that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Definitely a whole lot of people on Twitter posting pictures from it, Joel Telling. Naomi Wu. Lots of people out there having a good time. And I wish I could have made it this year, but I've been, I've actually been on quite a few trips already this year. And don't really have any money to spend on another plane ticket all the way from the West Coast. Okay, so those are all the pins soldered in for the 40 pin dip. We've got the, uh, the notch on the correct side here. I guess this camera is not, not necessarily the best. Let's see, maybe we can get that up just a little bit. And now I've got that one in, we'll move on to the next one, which is the RAM chip. Uh, second largest chip on the on the board. Two notches over there. The board actually has uh, there's this section for um, the RAM chip itself using either one of the large ones or the narrow gauge. There's actually pinholes in the center for one of the narrow gauge sockets if you use the narrow RAM. Um, this one actually came with the uh, looks like Hitachi 62256, which is, I mean, that's really common RAM. Seen that used in all sorts of projects. So 
get that one stuck in there and tack down at least one corner tack down the opposite corner make sure that it's seated that looks good and we'll just start solder out here and start pegging down each of the pins. This is a little tedious but it's actually kind of nice. Very relaxing work. Hey hey imagination to form are you are you on there? Hello? Don't see anybody watching, but I see your chat. How's it going? Hey, hey, he is there. Yeah, I guess the I guess the OBS Twitch integration is a little slow. It's not showing anybody in there, but uh, I do see your chat. Um, so yeah, just to, to recap, um, since you're actually the first person in here, um, I got a couple things going. I got uh, 3D printing going. Um, of course, my camera's blocking. Uh, I'm printing out some Star Trek game pieces uh, for a friend. Um, and uh, they're board game pieces that just get printed out in pieces and assembled into some nice little game pieces. Um, right now it's a United Federation of Planets Starbase. Um, I'll do, there's a Romulan one and a Klingon one that get printed out later. And then while that's printing, I've actually got this uh, electronics project. It's a board kit for a video card for an 8-bit computer. And uh, it's an 8-bit uh, video card based on the, the Texas Instruments TMS-9918, which was used in a lot of 8-bit computers in the early 80s, like uh, the TI-99-4A, uh, the Sega SG-1000, the MSX. Um, and this is actually for a computer kit. Um, oh, yeah, the ZX-81. Okay, yeah. It's it's that, that type of basic style um, video card where there's just a little bit, I mean, it, it does provide color graphics and it does provide, actually, there's a composite out that gets mounted to the board. Um, and right now I'm just going through and soldering in all the sockets and getting that put together. Um, the actual, let me see if I can get the computer out to show you. All right, after I get all this junk out of the way, This is, this is the Z80 project box. Let's see if I can switch that over. And this is a project I've been working on off and on for a little bit of, a little bit of time. It has quite a few boards on it. Some of them are kit boards, some of them are actually hand soldered boards. Um, like there's a CPU board. Uh, let's see if I can get everything out in one piece. There's one of the CPU boards, um, straight Z80 there. Um, it's actually got some LEDs just to identify certain things going on in the system, and that's all hand-wired. I did do that, uh, some of that on a stream, but uh, unfortunately the, uh, the stream timed out and was deleted by Twitch because I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a partner, or not, a, not an affiliate. And here's the back plane. Uh, the back plane literally is, is just a board with header sockets on it. And the back, you can see there, is, it's all hand-wired bus, individual colors, point to point the entire way. Um, that was quite a lot of soldering. Uh, seven times 40 pins. And the boards actually plug in like so. That's a CPU board. I have two CPU boards. One was a kit and one was actually just the hand assembled one. Um, there's actually a compact flash board that I have that uh, you can 
use with the CPM operating system. Um, and it emulates floppy drives, very large floppy drives, uh, on compact flash disks. Uh, let's see if I can get that in. Actually, I need to wake up that socket. These pins in this socket are a little, or a little stiff. Yeah, so there's that. Anyways, and uh, this is actually a 512K RAM ROM, um, so you can actually access 512K uh, of RAM on an 8-bit system, which is quite a bit. Um, and let's see if I can squeeze that in. Uh, there's also a serial port card, um, a timer card. There's a whole bunch of system options. And actually, you plug all these cards in and upload a firmware to the ROM, and you actually get a, a nice full working 8-bit uh, system with all sorts of freaking cool options. And of course, um, I want the video card on it as well, so I can actually use color video versus just uh, having the serial card, which would just be like a serial terminal. <laughs> Will it run Crisis? You know, it probably would run Crisis. I, there is a way to interface it to larger storage. So I could probably have it run through Crisis bite by bite and laugh and joke at me. <laughs> um, also, there is an MCP card. The MCP is a uh, it's a master control program. What goes on here actually is a Raspberry Pi. There's the socket for it here. Um, and there's a, a level converter, a USB port for serial, and some interface pins so that the Raspberry Pi can actually take the serial that's coming out of the 8 bit system serial card and display it on a Raspberry Pi terminal. And of course, give you HDMI video out for a serial terminal. It's not quite as pretty as what comes out of the 9918 card, but it's still pretty neat. And that, of course, is another option. And of course, this thing fully loaded is just, it's phenomenal. It's huge. And I've got some other cards that uh, I'm working on. I've got a hand-wired 512K RAM ROM card. Uh, in my office that I've been working on, and that, that one takes a long time because there are so many so many memory connections. So, that is that beast. And uh, yeah, I'm just continuing working on this. So your ZX81 had 18 or 16K of RAM. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh. Some of those, some of those older machines had like 2K, 4K RAM. Um, some of the early, early uh, Sinclair Spectrum stuff was was really low on RAM, um, but they were dirt cheap too. Um, you got to consider that some of those machines were $99, $150 at launch. All right, let's get to uh, me continue working on getting these sockets nailed down. Hey, kitty cat, how you doing? You being good? So what are you up to tonight, Imagination? It's a wonderful Friday night here on the West Coast. That was expensive back then. Dollars changed so much. Yes, um, but you got to consider too that some of the machines, some of the 8 bit machines around that time were $500, $600. I think even the, the Commodores were several hundred, depending on the options you got. Um, I have. Commodore 64 and also the SX64 portable I was playing with, both of those have 64K of RAM, uh, in addition to ROM chips and 
character ROM for the graphics. Just chilling, playing Defiance 2050 and needed a break. Defiance 2050. That sounds familiar. I've actually been out of playing games for a while because I've been busy trying to stream and do projects and get crap done around here. I'm going to have a whole lot of time to get stuff done around here uh, after next week. Uh, my entire office was just given uh, just given notice that uh, our contract had has expired and they don't have any more work for us. Uh, Microsoft laid off 90 different uh, vendor support teams. Um, I was providing Microsoft support for Exchange Online uh, to Exchange administrators. And uh, it, it's crazy because like they, they literally cut three of our teams out for Exchange. Um, and the caseload is not getting any lighter. So the people that still work there, uh, that, that still are working for Microsoft for Exchange support are going to have a lot more work to do. Um, I took my last support case today, and next week we're just going to be closing stuff out and uh, finishing up documentation, finishing up with any straggler customers that, that need to have uh, issues solved. Um, so yeah, there's that. But hey, it's not so bad. There are, I live in Seattle area, so there's, there's plenty of jobs. So... Got the RAM socket in, and now we will go with the smaller sockets, which are some of the latches for the data lines that go between the uh, between the video chip and the RAM. And I really need to get some blue tack to hold these sockets in, because uh, it's a pain in the ass to flip them upside down without them falling out. Down, tack down. Woo! And this kit build too is pretty simple. Um, really, the chips that it comes with um, it's the actual video controller chip, there's the RAM chip, and then there's just a couple of little uh, logic chips for things like interfacing to um, interfacing to the actual computer with I/O ports. Um, you actually send data to the video card through I/O ports one byte at a time. Uh, the hard way, <laughs> um, and then you know that's that's handled by these couple of these chips up here, I believe. And then all of this stuff down here is for handling interface between the RAM and the the actual video chip. That's just a little bit of glue logic. And we'll get the rest of these populated and tacked down. I really appreciate uh, guys who put together these kits that actually socket all of the chips uh, because these chips like the, the TMS-99 chip, um, that, that's, it's not a new chip. They, they don't make those chips anymore. This chip here actually has a date stamp of 8319, week 19 of 1983. Um, and so, I mean, it's an old chip. And, of course, if it fails, you know, I can order another one because there, there are tons of back stock available, especially from Japan. Um, a lot of the older machines were actually gutted for chips, so it's pretty easy to find pretty easy to find working ships for relatively cheap and by cheap I mean like 10 bucks 10 bucks or less um, in fact there's there's a lot of similarities in this RC 2018 or RC 2014 system design um, you can configure it so that it actually is set up like an MSX uh, computer was one of the more popular ones in Japan um, and then they came out with the MSX2, the MSX2 Plus. Um, the MSX2 series went well into the 90s. Um, 
really good systems. You can actually, I mean, you can find the MSX systems on eBay. Yeah, good thing they weren't melted down. No, actually, that's that's the funny thing is like, um, if you go on eBay, you can take a look. Um, just Google like MSX chips. Actually, let me see if I can. eBay. Let's take a look at that. Uh, MSX chip. Oh, there's actually an all-in-one MSX console. Um, those were custom third-party consoles that emulated a whole MSX on one hardware chip. Um, those are definitely not worth a thousand bucks, but I mean, whatever. They don't make them anymore, so I guess people will crank up the value. Um, Z chip lot MSX. One base search. Ah, get down, get get. Yeah, okay, see here. Um, see if you can, hopefully you can see my screen correctly. Like this, this first item here is a, a Z80 8 megahertz MSX kit, ColecoVision. Um, they have later ones like the MSX Turbo, which were a 33 megahertz system. Um, you can literally buy it like these chip sets, and it includes every every chip that was on the system. You know, all you need really is a board, and it's real easy to get a company to build boards for you right now, just like actually this one that I'm building now was dirt cheap uh, in bulk. At 25 bucks from China, and it includes, uh, there's the AY8910 uh, sound chip, the Z80 CPU, the 9958, which is uh, the grandson of this chip that I'm putting together right now. There's an EEPROM chip, there's some RAM, some serial, um, there's a ROM chip. There's actually a Z80 KIO, which is a, a fully integrated IO chip for Z80, it actually provides you with uh, serial ports, parallel ports, and other stuff. I think there's some timers in there as well. Uh, there's a Hitachi RAM, which is the same as the RAM that I've got right now, a 5-volt regulator. Um, and the Altera Max is actually the glue chip that uh, glues all the logic together. So yeah, there's, there's lots of kits like those where literally they just gutted these machines, gutted these boards, and pulled the chips off of them, and they sell them in bunches. Uh. All right, so get the larger ones in. Let's get these smaller sockets in. And that is the wrong one. This one goes here. Get those pins in. Wind up, tack down the corners, heat up the pin, pop on a little solder, and it sticks. Heat up the pin, pop on a little solder, and it sticks. And now at least the socket's got the corners pushed in. And we'll get this one slid in. Uh, I've got the, the Hakko FX888D, the, the digital one. It's the pretty popular common common one. Uh, let's see if I can. Yeah, it's just the, the standard 888D. Uh, works great. And yeah, I do have it cranked up to 750, um, which is very high. But um, as long as I don't dwell on anything, I'm not going to actually ruin any parts. I've gotten used to working with a really hot iron. <clears throat> you went with the non-digital one, yeah. Um, actually, uh, the non is the non-digital one with a dial. Does that have like a, a dial on it, or how does that work? Does it does it just go up to one temperature? Um, 
I've actually put together quite a few things with it. Um, this board here actually is a little CNC board that goes onto an Arduino Nano, or Arduino Uno, rather. Uh, it has four channels. Um, this actually is for my little tiny laser engraver. Um, and it's just got some crappy 8825 drivers in it. Um, and I'll, I'll probably replace those later. Uh, the laser engraver I have actually is based on, sorry, excuse me. Um, it's based on uh, stepper motors and rails from uh, DVD-ROM drives and the DVD lasers from those as well. It doesn't engrave very much. It just makes little marks on things. Um, but that was a cool little project. And uh, that's buried. I, uh, it's buried somewhere. Haven't had a need to engrave anything in quite a long time. <laughs> Actually, probably since I built it. And I'll get this last socket tacked down. And then I'll go back and start. sure all those orientations are correct on the sockets. Yeah, that looks right. It's the 40 pin, uh, 28 pin, a couple of 20s here, a couple of 14s and a 16 pin, and then the rest of it is just like uh, header pins, some resistors and a crystal, a bunch of capacitors, uh, jumpers, and hmm. Yeah, jumpers and the uh, composite out jack. Co composite out jack actually is this really nice panel mount that's got spring-loaded clip uh, tabs on it. Actually, sits on there really well once it's uh, once you mount it. It's almost strong enough to hold itself in without the solder. <laughs> I've seen people etch UV PCB boards with them. Yeah, uh, yeah, with a twenty a twenty five hundred watt engraver. You mean like a twenty five hundred milliwatt engraver? Twenty five hundred watts will blast through metal. Like literally, really blast through metal. Kilowatt machines are huge. Um, the one the the yeah milliwatt. <laughs> Yeah, the the one I have since it's just a it's just a DVD laser. It's I think it's limited to like under ten milliwatts or something. It's it's really really low. Um, but you overdrive it, it, it acts as a burner pretty well. Um, and of course, I could make it larger and actually put together like a three D printer style, like a Cartesian style printer with the laser attachment. They've got uh, 100, 200 milliwatt lasers for for pretty cheap on like AliExpress, that kind of thing. Um, but I haven't had a, I don't really have a need for a big laser engraver. All right, uh, yeah. Time to go back down and start tacking down all these socket pins. And while I'm doing that, actually, let's see. How is my printer doing? Oh, actually it's almost done. That's pretty good. That was faster than I was expecting by like half an hour. That is really good. That's a lot better than my earlier prints. Um, I was actually having problems printing those pieces. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can get, uh, switch the camera back. These were some of the star bases from the, the set. And these are the uh, Cardassian star base, like uh, Deep Space Nine. I don't know if you're familiar with Star Trek stuff. Um, and the tops completely blew out and I, I like the print was just toast. Um, and suppose, you know, when this actually is all said and done, um, let's see if I can clean.
clean that up. You know, it's supposed to go together like that, you know, like the standard Cardassian base. And there's a, there's a base that sits up underneath it that it mounts to to hold it on as a piece. Uh, but of course you can see it's like, it's completely effed up. <laughs> And I think with this with this one too, um, part of the issue is that I didn't have really good bed adhesion. Like you can see, this pylon here is actually taller and angled up. It it actually popped off the bed and was like printing high. And then when it uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks like the Dominion blew it up. <laughs> yeah, and, and it it totally destroyed like it ruined everything else on this. I tried to print out an entire set of pieces. Um, there's a Ferengi base, a Romulan base, a Klingon base. Ferengi base? Yeah, there, there's like five different bases and uh, the Federation base that I've got printing now. Um, and I really, I, I shouldn't have done it all at once. I should have actually thrown it on there. Um, I, I broke up the, the files actually by, by the base type. So it's got like two or three base pieces depending on the model and then the actual like a uh, mounting plate that they, they glue into. Um, and that's what's printing now on that one. Uh, yeah, that was almost done. And that's a, that's a Federation star base, uh, three pieces of it. And then there's a base in the back. And it's done and that'll cool off. That's actually quicker than I expected. Only took an hour and 20 minutes. And it's rendering a time lapse. Uh. Okay, yeah, so let's get back to tacking these down while that cools off. We'll uh, get these pins done. Tap, heat, tap, heat, tap. I go pretty quick. This is actually a, a, an easier board compared to some other boards that I've purchased in the past. Oh. And it sounds like it's raining. Yeah, fall decided to show up here in Seattle, so it's been raining this past week or two. The weather's been getting colder. A couple of the Starbucks now carry pumpkin spice latte. Since it started raining again, you know, it was totally allowed for them to carry all their pumpkin spice bullshit. <laughs> pumpkin spice, all the things. In fact, we were at the grocery store earlier today and they had all their pumpkin flavored donuts and pumpkin flavored cereals on the shelf. And it's like, really? Come on, guys. Little overboard. Yeah, it, um, this this hot co actually I've had it for maybe four or five years now. Yeah, so I, I do love pumpkin pie too. Like I will eat pumpkin pie all day. Give me that like a whole pie and a can of whipped cream and just I'll dive into that. Especially with some vanilla ice cream or like some apple pie with vanilla ice cream on top. Ugh. Bio mode. Yeah, I've had the Hako for four or five years. It's been actually really good. 
Uh, the tips last quite a long time, which is fantastic. And it, the kit actually came with quite a few. Uh, one thing I would like to get though is the, or at least try somewhere, so maybe borrow, see if somebody's got one, um, the, uh, the Hakko desoldering pump. Uh, the actual nice handheld one that's got the pump on it that, that can really suck the solder out. Because um, I've had a few projects where I really needed to, to remove some stuff or move things around, do repairs. Um, I'd like to replace all of the RAM on my Commodore SX64. And to do that, I need to essentially desolder all the RAM and solder in sockets because those are hard soldered onto the board, which is really unfortunate. Um, and also my, my regular bread box Commodore um, only has, I think, two or three of the chips out of like the 20 that are on it are socketed. Which is kind of annoying. Because chips fail. And especially older chips done in the 80s that use a lot of current and you know, they just get worn and they fail after a certain amount of time. That's why on one of my streams a couple weeks ago, I uh, replaced um, a PLA chip on uh, my SX64. Actually, I replaced it on both my both of my Commodores. Uh, yeah, that would be nice over a manual pump. Yeah, I, I really do want to, like... I see some of these guys that have these fantastic pumps, but they're not cheap at all. Um, and of course now I don't really have a lot of spending money, so that'll have to wait until I pick up another position and have some money to waste. Ah, crap. And I soldered over a, an unpopulated hole. I'll have to clear that up in a second. Ah. What is that? Oh, that's faster. That one's easy enough. Uh, let's do a double check. Make sure I got all the pins on all the sockets. Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, so that's the bulk of the, the soldering. Um, I still have the edge connector to do, which is done with this uh, 80 pin. This is actually two by 40 row um, right angle connector that kind of sits on the edge of the board like this. <clears throat> and that allows it to actually plug into the back plane on that, uh, that computer board. This card, though, actually only has about 10 pins on the second row, and all the rest of the pins on the second row are unused, so i got to pop out a bunch of extra pins on these ends uh, so this connector will actually fit in there. And then this little header strip will get broken up into smaller chunks for the header connections. Um, there's actually a set of jumpers here that selects the I.O. port address for the card which can vary. Um, you can actually configure it. Um, and there's some other jumpers over here for various things. Um, all right. So let's see. Actually, there's a few components over here um, that go on. There's just some basic jumpers over here. There's a crystal with a couple of capacitors just for the crystal. Um, there is a ferrite, uh, it's a ferrite bead, which is, uh, which goes on the video output. Uh, also coupled with this transistor that goes on the video output. Some generic decoupling capacitors that'll go next to all the chips. A couple of resistors for the video output and, you know, then this card will be pretty much complete. Um, unfortunately though, I don't have everything complete on my 
my actual computer, so I can't run the video right now. Um, that'll probably be, actually I might do that on the weekend, get the rest of that together. Um, yeah, let's start getting these capacitors in. And unfortunately for this one that I soldered the hole over, I'm gonna hold that there. to use any of the desoldering wick I have on that one. But it looks like I'm right. And of course I didn't pull any of that out, did I? it's not where I need it to be. <laughs> Which figures. Huh. I will be right back. Let's see if I can go find that. Darn, where did that go? Looked on Amazon, they aren't very cheap. Yeah, no, no, no. I think the, the one that I saw, the one Hakko desoldered, was like 150 or 200 all by itself, which was like outrageous. And of course I can't find it. <sighs> well, that's a pain in the ass. Um, hmm. So what I'm gonna do here is see if I can make a plunger. That resistor is not gonna sit very tall, so it doesn't need the whole lead. Let's see if I can poke through this hole I accidentally stuck some solder on.
<sighs> and I get solder on both of those. This is what happens when you screw up. Get in your hole. Solder and wiggle, solder and wiggle. <laughs> Some days could be better. And we'll just go ahead and clip those leads. And throw some extra salt on there. Uh, all right. Now well, let's get the rest of these bastards in. Drop them in, bend the legs out. These are all, it's all pretty easy to, to pop these around. Oh. oh, you need to get to sleep. All right, thanks so much, stop for uh, thanks for stopping by. Imagination, um, get some good sleep and uh, play some more games tomorrow. Have a good weekend. And we'll get these, get that capacitor put in there, and. Thankfully, it's pretty easy to deal with the capacitors. Good sleep, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, hopefully you get some sleep. Any sleep is better than none. Definitely don't stay up on my part. All right. And just sliding in these decoupling capacitors for each of the chips. And bending the legs out so they will stay in place while I solder them. Let's see. We got we got another viewer in chat. Automation Jason. Jason, are you there? You hanging out, man? Or did you just stop by temporarily? Say hi, man. Say hi in chat. I am putting together a, a video card for an 8-bit computer. Actually, a home-built 8-bit computer, which is this machine over here. The Z80 Beast. I'll eventually design and print a 3D printed case for that as well. So, okay. I've got the capacitors in place, the bypass capacitors in place. After I get those done, I will do the
capacitors for the crystal. And we'll get the crystal dropped in too. And get some of the other passive components like the resistors and headers. Get that stuff soldered in. More solder. And yes, in case anybody's wondering, I am using leaded solder. It's not only good for the environment, it's really good for making good solid connections that don't end up having tin whiskers later on. So those are the capacitors on the board, little blue dots. And now we'll get the excess leads clipped off of those. And it says I've got one viewer left. Do I actually have one viewer? Is anybody watching? Say hi. Say hi in the chat. Subscribe. You know. Make it interesting. Hang out. Ask questions. Double checking just to make sure I got everything soldered. I didn't make a mess out of any of the traces on the board. Everything looks okay other than just some little bits of rosin from the solder. All right, so I've got those in um, now for the bypass capacitors. Um, these are, or sorry, for the uh, crystals capacitors. And these are some kind of generic. They've got their legs pre-bent outwards. Um, they just need to be bent back into the standard position to fit in the smaller slots on the board. Um, the guy who put together the kit said that uh, they, they just ordered them in bulk because they were extremely cheap and the ones that came just had bent leads. But that's real easy to just bend back. Bend them straight and take the little Z bend out. I'm not going to complain too much. The kit was pretty cheap, including the actual TMS 9918 chip and RAM. It had all the chips on it. So I'm just straighten those leads out a little bit. And Pop that sucker in there. Now that's in, we'll go ahead and straighten out the legs on the other one. You can see there, just got that 90, little 90 degree Z bend in there. And we'll pop that sucker right back straight. Right back straight. Easy enough. And we'll bend those leads out just to just to get them. Just 
just to get it to stick. And this is the actual crystal. Um, that is a 10.73 megahertz crystal. Uh, that's required by the chip for, I believe, generating the, the pixel clock, actually putting all the pixels on the screen. Um, in with an NTSC composite. And get that plugged in there and bend those leads out just enough to hold it into place. Grab a soldering iron and tack those down. Nice and easy. Mm -hmm. And I got some oxidation on the end of my on the end of my lead here. Clean that up a bit. And clean up some of this excess solder that I dropped on the board from blobbing on the tip. Hey, hey, Jason, there you are. Good to see you. How you doing, man? I am doing a mix of projects tonight. I am 3D printing and I am building a video card for an 8-bit computer. In fact, my printer is done printing and it's cooled off and I will probably pop some parts off of it back there. About to crash just passing through tonight. Okay, that's cool. Thank you for stopping by. It helps. Anybody that uh, contributes to the chat and contributes to my average viewer count is <laughs> it's always appreciated. And here is... Come on off the plate. There it goes. There's... This is a piece for a Star Trek board game. Actually, this is part of the piece. Um, several of these pieces put together actually uh, build star bases that are used in the game. Um, there's a Federation star base, Klingon star base, Cardassian star base, Romulan star base, and uh, I'm making these, printing these out for a friend who doesn't have a printer, although he wants one and really wants to get into 3D printing, so I'm going to try to impress him with some nicer prints. Try to get more people into the hobby because you know the more people that are 3d printing the better <laughs> the more people that are wasting their time and it looks like these are still adhering pretty well to the to the bed Yeah, there's a couple of the pieces. Let's see, it looks it looks a bit like the Federation Starbase. Um, there's like I think there's an intermediate piece in there, and the other piece that's gonna pop off the board. And then there's a big flat base that goes on the bottom of it. And these are printed in uh, white PET G. And you got a couple of blobs on the top that I'll clean up. Hard to see on the shitty camera that I've got here. And there's the base piece. Um, use my wonderful print remover. And of course, that went all the way into the back. <laughs> yeah. 
And actually, there's all the pieces. I have no idea how all of this goes together. I should probably look at the instructions. I believe it's this way. That looks about right. The actual, the pieces were separated by the author uh, so that you could actually 3D print these without supports. So there weren't any extreme overhangs. Like you can see that that's a huge overhang. It would require a lot of support. Um, and it's easier just to break them up and then uh, put some CA glue on them, stick them together, or, or whatever glue will work with uh, PETG. And that's cool. That actually came out really nice. All things considered. And I will go ahead and actually print out another one of those uh, right after I throw some more adhesive on the bed. Adhesive of choice, Aquanet. Works fantastic on glass for most most plastics. Oof. Downside is that it smells like hairspray. <laughs> All right. <sighs> hmm. So yeah. Okay, anyways, back to this. I got uh, I got the crystal for the clock driver, or the not clock driver, and its capacitors installed. Put the excess leads on those. Now, I've got a few, I've got jumpers here, jumpers here for configuring some, I believe, excuse me, <clears throat> I believe that uh, one of these is for configuring the, the interrupt, it might be one over here, and then the jumper set that goes up here is for selecting the IO address. <clears throat> I've been digging glue stick, though it leaves pattern on the bottom of the print. Uh, I only draw a grid over the print area and clean it off with the wet paper towel after the print. Uh, honestly, the the hairspray that I've been using, the Aquanet, um, I lay down like a couple, like I lay down a layer and let it dry uh, with the, the bed heated. I lay down another layer on top of that with the bed heated and wait till that dries. And I can actually print half a dozen times on that surface, even like the same print, so it's actually in the same adhering in the same spots and it will it will adhere after you know half a dozen prints it, it's it actually is surprisingly good um, it works really well with ABS it works pretty darn well with pet G it works less well with uh, PLA but I don't print on a lot of PLA and it does not work at all with uh, any of like the nylons or the the flexibles um, I, I just tried that and it just didn't help at all And then, you know, every now and then I'll take just a wet paper towel, completely wipe it clean with just water. Um, no actual cleaning solution, no, no alcohol or anything like that. And then I'll just spray it down one more time. Um, I do have actually um, over to the left here, uh, let's see if I can, over to my left here. Um, you can see it on the big screen. This is my, the big black frame is my hypercube evo and you can see i've got the wiring going on that uh, as well as a uh, a duet to wi-fi board um, that this is a project in progress 
um, and I've got a 300 millimeter square heat bed that's going on there that I'm, I've got um, build tech for. Build tech? Oh no, sorry, gecko tech. I've got uh, gecko tech uh, surface for it. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of great things about it and I got to play with it at Murph and it looked really awesome so I bought a bunch of it and I'll get to play with it sometime once I actually get the control mechanics finished on this monster. Hey cat. How you doing? I'd bring you up on TV, but I got static stuff up here. Discharge. Can't have a static prone cat on an electronics project. Yeah, hairspray, like, it, it's funny too. Like, some people swear by hairspray, others can't get it to work at all. And honestly, the it's it's Aquanet Extra Super Hold. There's there's no fragrance, there's no additives to it. It's just, it's unscented, basic. I mean, it, it's spray glue is what it is. It's also, it also, I mean, this is an 11 ounce can, uh, 312 grams worth, and they're like $2.99 at the grocery store. Like this is a significant amount of material for very little money. I have not tried it on any other bed types. Um, the only thing that I print on is borosilicate glass. Um, it just, it's, uh, it doesn't expand um, like some other, like some of the direct metal beds. Um, so yeah, uh, I really like printing on glass with the hairspray on it. Um, let's see. I've got clippers. I got the ferrite bead that goes in that's part of the video output circuit. A little bit better. <laughs> Get that through the hole a little easier. Some of the, the these parts are, are larger, intended for different types of different types of mounting, but they're cheap parts, so. Go with what's inexpensive. And then just bend the leads back to where you need them. Mutayab. Mutayab, hey, how's it going? Hi, how you doing? Um, I am, my name's Duo, in case you haven't been here before. Um, I do 3D printing, electronics projects, and all sorts of retro computing stuff. Um, Currently, I'm building a video card. Um, this came as a kit to go into my 8-bit computer, which uh, some of which is hand-built here. It's a Z80-based computer. Um, that's actually got. Uh, there's quite a bit of interface cards. There's a really a big CPU card on here, Z80-based. 512k of RAM and ROM. There's actually a. Uh, compact flash card in here that can mount images, uh, disk images really easily, serial cards. Um, there's also a Raspberry Pi interface, which is kind of nice for serial. And that project, it's, it's progressing. This is actually the video card with video output for it. I just got it in the mail today. 
um, and it's it's based on the TMS 9918 um, video chip, which was used in a lot of 8-bit computers in the um, the early 80s, mid 80s, like the TI 994A. Although I think that one's a 16-bit computer. Um, the MSX computer, the Sega SG 1000 computer, and also the ColecoVision. Um, and uh, actually, a guy on the board, a uh, guy on one of the retro computing boards, put this kit together. And very inexpensive kit too, which is great. Um, genuine. <clears throat> excuse me. A uh, genuine 1983 TMS 9918 chip. Hey, and now he's a follower. Awesome. Thanks for following. Appreciate it. Um, and the you know, other genuine chips, they're they're old. They don't actually produce those chips anymore. And uh, I'm just going through and getting all the parts soldered on. Um, unfortunately, I won't get the board running tonight because there's still more that I need to do on the the back plane. I need to get the power con. Uh, there's a power regulator that powers the whole thing that I need to get soldered in. Um, because this system actually sucks up, I think, with all the cards enabled and everything that I have going enabled, um, the the cards can suck up like two and a half amps. It's it's not a lightweight computer. 8-bit um, machines tended to require a whole lot of power. Um, you know, relative to to what you would think, like like my cell phone. My cell phone runs on standby at like 100 milliamps of power. <laughs> so I just got a ferrite bead put in there and soldered in place. Got the leads clipped. So, uh, Muda, yeah, what do you do? Like, uh, what are your hobbies? What are you into? Um, obviously, you saw my stream on here, uh, 3D printing and electronics. So I guess you're interested in those. Um, I do have a couple 3D printers. I've got one back here. Yeah, I got Pet G sitting up on top. Uh, actually, that Pet G box is what is currently loaded in this machine here. Um, it's a Mendel Max 3. And I am printing Star Trek board game pieces for a friend of mine um, and these are the white uh, pet G pieces in fact I'm going to set it up to, to print out another run of this um, and these these pieces actually assemble into a star base this is the uh, Federation star base and they sit on they sit on the platform there, and these are actually game pieces that would go on the board. Um, a friend of mine is heavily into board games, and he really wanted some of these, but he doesn't have a printer yet, so I printed some up for him. Um, although this is the first successful print out of 15 that I have to print, so that's going to take a little while. But I'm going to fire that one up again since the first batch came out all right. Um, on my left here, on screen right, you see there's a big black frame that is a Hypercube Evo Hypercube Evolution uh, Core XY printer that I'm currently building. And that's all run off of this control board, which is a uh, Duet 2 Wi Fi. Um, and I'm still working on configuring it, which is why all the wires are hanging out. Um, just making sure, going through and testing all the motors in the motion. Uh, I'm doing mechanical engineering technology, just started second year. Nice, very nice. Uh, it's nice to hear people actually in school and, and getting some really good degrees. Engineering is fantastic. Mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. Uh, I've got lots of friends that are either electrical engineers, um, aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers. Uh, and, you know, they, they, those types of degrees can pay pretty damn well. So stick with it. <laughs> Uh, and and the, the build volume for the, the HyperQB build I have here, it's a 300 by 300 by 550. Um, it's kind of hard to see on the, the, the camera on here is kind of fisheye in it, but uh, these uprights here are actually 800 millimeters, almost a full meter. Um, and it's, it's a pretty heavy duty machine. Um, all, of them, all of some really nice components on that. Um, and I need to get that thing printing, so let's switch on back over to OctoPrint. And 
Let's go ahead and fire that same print up one more time. Although I need to clip off that little straggler. Oops, and I knocked the camera. And I've got that printer in an enclosure with the uh, the temperature and humidity sensor. Um, unfortunately, I live in a I live in a really humid place. Um, I live in Seattle, and in fact, it was just raining. It's probably raining right now. Um, so the humidity levels outside are pretty high. Um, inside, that one's only showing 34% humidity at 30 C. Uh, that's actually a pretty low humidity for us, <laughs> at least within the the heat chamber there. Um, so yeah, actually, let me get back to the rest of the components on here. I got the ferrite bead in place. I've also got this transistor to put in. Uh, the transistor, a couple of resistors, uh, and the ferrite bead that are there are part of the video output section, the analog section. And we'll just bend these leads. Those leads bent, bent up into place so they fit in so they fit in the holes here on the board. These are actually really narrow. So I need to bend the outer legs back in really tightly. Um, let's see, mechanical engineering technology different than mechanical engineering? Yeah, a little bit. More practical and computer design based compared to theoretical. CAM based. Ah. Yeah. Um, 3D printing is definitely, uh, 3D printing and mechanical engineering share an awful lot of the same principles and same design design ideas, uh, technologies. So, uh, Mudayab, do you actually have uh, 3D printers? Printers that you might, uh, anything you got going, anything you're printing, things you like to print? Took a workshop a month ago. So you don't have one yet? I would suggest getting a nicer inexpensive printer, not one of the super cheap ones. If you get a super cheap one, you're going to spend all of your time learning about how not to do things with a 3D printer. Like this piece of crap behind me on my right, on your screen left, this is a Tronxy XY X8 printer, which is like the ANET A8. Um, the, the frames are made out of actually laser cut acrylic. And laser cut acrylic or any other laser cut plastic is not not good for a frame. Um, I think that kit was 150 bucks and absolutely not worth it at all. Um, both of these machines here, I mean, obviously this one's a kit. This is a kit I've built myself. Um, all of the extrusions, the rails, everything, um, all the, the precision mechanical parts are from Misumi. Um, the one that's in here was a kit that's the Mendel Max 3. It's all aluminum extrusion um, with some steel plate panels for like the front and back. 200 set. Which, which kit did you buy? $270 kit. There are some good kits in that price range. Um, definitely, you got to be real careful with any kit that's under two or three hundred dollars. There are a whole lot out there that are crap, and there are there are some that are good. And 
definitely no matter what kind of kit you buy a hick top chris i3 clone okay uh, i think i have heard good things about that one There's so many Prusa i3 clones out there. Um, technically, this thing is an i3 clone style, but it, it is less i3 and more as cheap as they could have made it. Honestly, I think those machines there probably materials cost less than 70 bucks, 60 bucks maybe. The Chinese throw them together for so little money. And printer started. And it is printing, but it's printing. Do I got YouTube? Yes, I do actually have YouTube. Um, in fact, um, I am starting to upload my Twitch streams to YouTube. Um, it's youtube.com slash duo dream. Um, same as my username here on Twitch, except it does not have the ER on it. Um, I do, I, I have some other videos up on YouTube, um, some personal stuff, some RC stuff, some flying stuff. I actually, I fly. Um, it's been a hobby for, for quite a while. Um, flying actual real airplanes, um, just a really expensive hobby. <laughs> um, so I've got some flight videos up there, some RC videos, and some miscellaneous stuff up there as well. Um, in fact, let's see. Uh, let's see if I can bring that up here real quick. YouTube.com slash dream. Is it going to pull it up correctly? Yep, sure enough. Yeah, so that's my channel. Um, I've got some flying videos on it. Um, I still have to fix my... Nope, it's auto-playing. Um, I've got to uh, actually have to approve my Twitch videos and get them up on the, on the feed here. Um, but I've got, uh, there's a couple. Um, Lego Voltron. Uh, my Commodore SX64 that I, I bought and started refurbishing. Um, I do Legos too. Legos, Legos is fun. Um, of course, now that I'm an adult, I can actually afford Legos. <laughs> um, but yeah, lots of lots of different videos. Um, I fly aerobatics. I, I've flown in quite a quite a few different airplanes. And hopefully I'll actually get more videos up there of doing some of these projects, getting some of that stuff on there. And that printer seems to be stuttering a little bit. Oh, actually, it sounds better now. So that's up and printing. That's good. Looks like it's getting down an OK first layer. Um, so yeah, uh, I've got that, uh, that YouTube there. Uh, I'm also on, uh, on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter if you want. Uh, w I really need to get this bot set up to spam this stuff out. Hopefully that link should work. Yep, link works. Yeah, so there's that. Good, continue to print normally. I appreciate that. Uh, this the streaming that I've been doing is, is just been a recent thing. I've started getting into it. Um, I have been a moderator for other 3D printing streamers. Uh, I've got quite a few 3D printing friends. Uh, in fact, Automation Jason is one of them. Um, 
I most recently have done moderation for Jetman, uh, J-A-T-M-N, on Twitch. Um, he last year did a whole lot of 3D printing. He even had a, a weekly show 3D printing tonight. Um, and that's tapered off because he actually got a new job with a 3D printing company. Um, it's nice that he's got that job. I, I really am happy for him on that one. Um, I don't use Twitter, but we'll follow me on YouTube. Subscribe. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I really do. And uh, I, I do want to do a whole lot more videos. I have all these electronic projects that I, I love doing. I have the printer projects that I'm doing. And I'm going to do these projects anyways, so I figured might as well get a camera going and actually put this stuff together. Hey, DeRusso, how you doing? What are we destroying today? Uh, I am 3D printing some pieces for a Star Trek board game for a friend of mine in, uh, in some white pet G. He's actually going to gonna paint them. Um, the pieces actually build, they're, uh, they're broken up so that you don't need supports on them, but they build star bases for a, uh, for a board game. And a friend of mine doesn't have a printer and wanted to print some out, so I'm running through a batch of that for him. And while those are printing, I've actually got a video card kit for an 8-bit computer. Um, and it's based on the TMS9918 uh, video chip, which is a really old video chip. Uh, in fact, you can see the one here that came with the kit um, has a date code on it of 1983. And that fits actually into this computer, this literally this computer that I built by hand. Oh, I'm just destroying the printer. The printer itself is totally getting worn out. <laughs> I'm destroying a roll of PET-G in there and Hopefully, hopefully that finishes printing out. Uh, yeah, it, it the PET G is okay if you use certain types of um, certain types of primer, and I've got one primer. I think I think Tamiya makes it um, that just sticks phenomenally well. Um, The actual PETG I'm using is just the Hatchbox. Um, I got that on Amazon. I, I think those were about 20 bucks a roll, which is pretty pretty inexpensive for the most part. Um, and for both DeRusso and Muda Yeb, um, some of the other projects that I've done on stream, although I, I, screwed, I lost one of the recordings up, up here, these two boxes with LEDs on them. This is a, an actual replica of a PDP-8 mainframe computer front panel. It's actually got a Raspberry Pi in it, a bunch of switches on the front, and it actually runs uh, disk images and paper tape images off of USB. Um, the one actually with the red LEDs is a PDP-11 replica. All those are switches on the front. You can actually control it like you would back in the 60s and 70s. Um, all the switches on the front work. Yes, I also did Voltron. I did a Lego Voltron. In fact, yeah, that's on my uh, that's on my YouTube. I, I got that uploaded to my YouTube as well. Um, I've done a whole bunch of Lego. Uh, recently, got another. There's an expansion kit for the Lego Ninjago City that actually has city docks. So there's more buildings. That was a two hundred and some odd dollar, two hundred fifty dollar Lego kit. Um, gosh, Legos are expensive. Um, I don't think I did that one on stream. Um, it took a few days. My wife and I like to build Legos together, and we've got quite a few of them. So I've got stuff like that as well. Um, and I just got a whole bunch of a whole bunch of material up there. In fact, there's a, a spool in front of the Pet G that's kind of hard to see up there. It's actually Atomic Filament Starry Night. Um, that's up in a bag. Is that the kit we did behind you? Yes, this is the pain in the ass Tronxy X8. Uh, and it doesn't print. I mean, well, okay, technically it can print. It does functionally print. Um, but I use it as a test bed for testing control boards. Actually, the control board I have in it right now is the MKS Gen L. Uh, I think that's a... Yeah, the Gen L version 1.0, which is a nicer, it's a nicer board, and it's actually socketed. <laughs> Name mine the Dun XY. Yeah, yeah, definitely done. Um, 
this driver board here actually has uh, TMC 2130 drivers on it, which are the nice ones, and they're they're actually hooked up with a harness using the SPI control, so they're they're full on digital control, and I use that as a test bed for the configuring of it. it so it doesn't print; it just moves. If I can get it to make this thing move, then I'll throw it into other things. Um, up here on the right, I've got my my Hypercube Evo build with my Duet Wi-Fi card um, that's in progress. Um, everything actually on that is, has turned out working. All the all the motors are wired up. Um, I just got to actually clean up, print some uh, print some wire retainers to actually hold the wire inside the the, the uh, T slot, and uh, get everything all cleaned up and put together. In fact, the, uh, the carriage up here. Um, the motors are actually the XY motors are mounted up top as well. I just need to I need to get the actual GT2 belt installed. Um, was working on getting like the end stops. I've got some end stops installed here. Um, had some 3D printed mounts for optical end stops that I printed out the other day. Um, I want to actually use polycarbonate for the enclosure. Um, yeah, actually on the outside, absolutely. Um, and of course the T-slot makes that really easy. I can actually just wrap it and screw those in real nice and real nice and easy. Um, but I've got, I've got quite a bunch of optical end stops. And since this is a, a larger core XY machine, I actually wanted to get, um, both Z max and Z min, uh, the Z min of course will be on a sensor that's on, um, the print head. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to go with a piezo sensor on the print head. The Z Max is going to be this optical. It's kind of going to kind of be a fail safe on Z Max, um, but I'm also going to put a secondary Z min on there in case the bed actually crashes the head um, and goes beyond where the head should be. So this will stop it. Um, and then actually the Core XY, you can do um, sensorless homing, which is surprising that you can do that on a Core XY system, considering the motion on both motors is blended. Um, these optical end stops, Deruso, I got, um, actually I got these on Amazon. And they're just the, the regular generic optical end stops that, uh, that you can find anywhere. Um, all the Chinese, cheap Chinese sites have them. Um, I liked these end stops so much. Um, they have been reliable enough that I replaced all the, the physical end stops on my Mendel Max 3 with the opticals. Um, and they just continue to work. Um, let's see. What else do I have going? Honestly, I'm just working on getting all the components on this board. Um, excuse me. The Z80 computer here that I've got, there's actually a, a CPU board. There's a Raspberry Pi board that's kind of a serial interface. Um, a standard serial board, 512K of RAM and ROM for an 8-bit computer, um, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, there's a compact flash card interface in there, which is really nice. And most of these cards I actually built by hand. In fact, the CPU card here is literally wired point to point by hand, um, which that card took quite a while. Um, I've got another one for another memory board that's taking even longer because there are so many connections on it. Hundreds and hundreds of connections, point to point connections to wire up. And for each of those, I actually have to take a piece of wire, measure it out, clip the ends of the wire, and solder that one into place. And that's one wire. It's, it's one of those things that takes days to get it done right. Um, okay, so let's see. Actually, I can probably get the video out port mounted on and get that soldered up. And it fits in there just like that. It's actually got some, it's got bent pins on it that help retain it in the socket and they're very large pins with very large holes um, for mechanical retention. Um, definitely a lot of mechanical support in that. At least there will be when I get some solder into it. Yeah. 
and we'll go ahead and clean the end off of it. Uh, I wanted to replace my end stops on my Axiom to optical. Um, I, yeah, you probably could. Um, the hardest thing with replacing your end stops is um, actually, in most cases, you'll have to design new pieces and print out new pieces that either sit where the old bumper, wherever, whatever bumper would hit the switch and extend out a little flag for the optical sensor. Um, the x-axis on the Mendel Max that's printing back here, um, I actually cut out a piece of sheet metal, a little tiny sheet metal flag, and it's uh, I punched a hole in it, so there's a hole, uh, a little flag that sticks out, and it actually mounted to the base where the wheel is. Um, this is V-slot wheel on the carriage. Um, because in the original design, the wheel was what ran into the mechanical end stop, the actual switch. Um, so the wheel is already right there. The bolt on the wheel is already right there. So that was that was a real easy implementation. And, and I, I had some sheet metal and some tin snips lying around, so I just put that on there. So let me get this cleaned up here and get some solder on it. I've got some solder in there now, but the holes are not quite filled in yet. I just want to make sure at least it was lined up a little bit. That's pretty good. Now I'll go in and fill in the hole. That's what she said. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's a pretty good solid mechanical connection on there. Wow, I've actually got five viewers now, it says. That's pretty cool. Welcome viewers. For anybody that's just joining, um, I'm Duo. I do 3D printing, I do electronics projects, I do retro computing projects. Um, I also do Legos from time to time. Um, if you have any questions about 3D printing, electronics, Legos, go ahead and pipe up in chat. If you want to introduce yourself in chat, go right ahead. If you want to follow, go ahead and click that follow button. I definitely need some followers. <laughs> trying, trying, to get, uh, trying to get my affiliate status or whatever that first status is with Twitch. Uh, if you want to lurk, go ahead and lurk. And how's that print doing? Oh, that print looks fantastic. I am really happy about that. So we'll go ahead and fill in the other connector on this, get some more solder on there. Two very nice solid solder blobs filling up the holes. And <laughs> of course now after I did that intro, it looks like I have four viewers. Somebody left. Let's see who's in the list. Automation Jason is lurking. DeRusso's in here. Electrical Longboard. Hi. Imagination to Form was in earlier. Uh, Moodya yeah, was in. Skinny Seahorse. Hi, everyone. All right, let's see. Unfortunately, the uh, the desktop camera I have here is, is kind of crap. The resolution on it's really bad. But uh, hopefully I'll get that one replaced with something a little bit nicer, maybe a cheap C920 or something. Electric is a bot. Are they busy? Eh. Yeah, it happens. Um, every now and then, actually, uh, I have bots pop in and pop out really quick. I don't mind. As long as people are showing up, somebody's chatting, 
um, Imagination to Form was chatting earlier, Automation Jason was in here chatting, uh, Moody Hub just joined first time, and he subscribed, thank you for doing that. And then you join Chat and DeRusso, and that, that really helps with my uh, my minimum viewer chatter count. Um, all right, actually, I need to take a look at what I am doing. There are a couple of resistors that were in the pack here, and I need to identify which is which because they're not written down. So I need to go back to. Opera. That is a big pile of dinosaur poop. <laughs> All right. Uh, go back to Tindy here. Um, this the uh, the board that I'm working on, the RC9918. Electric is in everyone that does creative and IRL. That's cool. That's good to know. So yeah, um, the board here will look a bit like this. Oh, it looks like they got a jumper in one of those slots, so that's good. And uh, the video output is actually color. Um, this is a sample program, just as a Mandelbrot. Um, there's a little animated Neon Cat, which is pretty funny. And here's a picture, in fact, of... Oops, let me get that loaded up. But yeah, mine is blue. Um, mine is actually a later revision. Um, in fact, mine is blue. Um, and mine uses a wider chip for the RAM. This is the RAM socket here. Um, there is There are headers on the inside if I needed a narrower socket for a narrower type of RAM, um, which if you look on the browser, um, The RAM that they've got here, actually, up on the up on the top left, is uh, that's the narrow type of RAM. But it's the same. It's a 256k k bit RAM. Some interface logic for the RAM and the, the video processor, and some logic for the actual I/O ports. And I just got to get a couple of these pieces in. Um, but this is definitely an earlier revision of the board. And this image here shows it in an RC2014, actually commercially produced, well, somewhat commercially produced board, uh, which is just like the board that I've got here, except I built this one by hand. Um, soldered all the bus connectors and the power connectors by hand, which took forever. But all the wires are nice and color-coded and really straight. I was really happy that came out really so well. Um, and hopefully I can get that booting up. Um, I have... Something behind me started making noise. Turns out it's a cat. Thankfully it's not the printer. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, the... The machine, actually the computer as it is right here, only has a serial interface on it for actually connecting to it. And just a basic terminal, you can log in, run basic, run CPM operating system. Um, standard, you know, 8-bit terminal computer stuff, but of course this, this board here will give it at least a somewhat nicer interface and can actually run some graphic, uh, graphic demos. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the other, actually one of these other nights this weekend, I might put together another kit that I have. I have another kit that's actually um, the audio board that will actually make it an MSX compatible. And DeRusso is AFK. Actually, so let me, let me get back on. for the instructions over here. Um, oops. Nope, actually that would be perfect. In fact, I will bring I will bring 
that image up because that image is large enough you can actually see the color color bands on the on the resistors which that'll make easy placement on that one And where is where does the schematic go? Do we have a schematic over here? Or did I not have that tab open? Of course I didn't have that tab open. Oh yeah, and there's the boards. In fact, it looks like this guy used um, PCB way uh, for these boards. I've actually used them for a set of boards that I had produced for another project I'm gonna do on stream here pretty soon. Um, they make boards that, that come out fantastic and they vacuum seal them like this in this bubble wrap and boy they come quick. I mean it took less than a week to get those boards from China. In fact, uh, here's a demo of that machine running a NAN kit in the NANCAT demo. And of course it sounds horrible, but I mean the, this is at least some of the graphics capability of this board. And yeah, it looks like they got a burger time running on it as well. So yeah, let me I need to find Got a yellow, purple, brown, which is this one here. Goes in the R3 slot. I can totally do that. Now just go back on that. That's fine. So yellow, purple, brown goes into R three. Get that one stuck in there. And then we've got brown, green, black. And brown, green, black goes into R1. Those pop right in on that board there. Actually get the leads bent out here so they stay on the board while I flip it over. And I'm probably not talking loud enough for the microphone. Um, just getting the resistors soldered in here. And in addition to the resistors, it looks like I also need to solder in a jumper where R2 is. And my soldering iron's oxidizing again. Let me get some flux on there. Get that solder to stick. Come on, guys. All right. Okay, now I'll clip off the leads on those resistors. And in fact, one of those leads I will save and use for the jumper that is used in the slot next to the resistors. Back 
Let's see if I can get this one bent correctly. It's just a just a lead bent into a little U shape, and we'll get that plugged in from the top. And it's got a blow of the solder on it that is stopping it from going through. Clean that one off, and we'll get this damn jumper stuck in place. Get in your hole. The needle nose pliers out and get this thing actually in there. And there it goes. Popped right in. How long is the print? Uh, the print, um, I just, I, this is a second batch of this print. Um, it ran for about an hour and 20 minutes the last time. Um, and it's, it's running slow on purpose. And um, I made these pieces purposely completely solid, um, solid plastic. There's no like hollow infill on it. Um, so they're, they're actually quite, quite strong parts. Pet G is just fantastic. Um, although it can be a pain to actually print with. Sometimes getting your print settings dialed in for Pet G is, is a pain in the ass. Um, and I, I have the speed on this print slowed down uh, because the printer in the corner actually is not the it's not the most precise printer when it starts going fast. Um, the carriage weight is gosh, the, that, the X carriage on there where the print head is, is it probably weighs at least half a pound. Um, and when it moves back and forth really fast, it, it tends to vibrate. Um, so you see like little print quality variations because of the vibration when it's moving back and forth. Uh, no, it's not a Bowden setup. It's actually a direct drive. Um, let's in fact, let me see, let me, let me throw off the camera on Octoprint here. Um, it is the, the actual carriage that's on it, it's huge. Um, and the entire right half of the carriage has nothing on it. It's actually intended for dual uh, extruder, like full on direct drive dual extruder. It's huge carriage. Um, there's a full NEMA 17, full length NEMA 17 with a direct drive straight on it. Um, I do have a tube on it um, that is wrapping around the top. Um, so it's, it's at least it's a Bowden feed tube, but it's not, the, the driver is not on the back end of it. All right, let's get this uh, let's get this jumper soldered in. And we'll just trim off the excess on those leads. check that just to take a look at it and make sure it looks okay. It's the uh, resistors and the ferrite bead and the transistor that actually comprise the analog video output section. All right, now that we got those in place, um, I believe I can move on to the jumpers. And the jumpers are actually just done with these little snap strips. You can snap off as many pins as you need. And little jumpers like you would have on your motherboard that just connect over two pins. Um, the jumpers in this one are used to configure things like the I.O. address that the computer can actually communicate with the video card at. Um, regular computers, desktop computers, have very similar very similar things still. Um, there are I.O. ports on the computers, on the motherboard, 
um, to access different parts of the motherboard. Um, temperature sensors are all on little I.O. ports you can access. Um, so a, a lot of those base concepts really haven't changed. They've just become more complicated. Um, so let's see. We'll snap off here. And these are just little snap. The, the plastic band in the center has spots you can snap it off at. So you can snap off just the ones you need. And we need a three. So there's three. And we'll need a four. So there's a four. And then I will need four more threes. There's a three. There's a three. There's a three. And there's a three. And it looks like I have a little bit left over, which is fine. These strips come in 40 pin strips, so it's, it's pretty common to have little extras left over. I can definitely throw those on other projects or on, an, on another board, in fact. So I'm going to get these headers plugged in. And what you'll see with the headers, they, they just pop out. They just stick out of the top of the board. And you put a jumper across the top of them. In fact, I'm going to put a jumper on them right now to kind of align them for soldering so they don't, uh, they don't separate. Um, when this is actually in its runtime configuration, only one of these jumpers will be on. Uh, depending on what address I want to set up, for communication for the video card. So get that in and let's get one of these pins tapped down real quick. A little bit of solder so the whole jumper array stays in place. And we'll tap the opposite corner so that stays in place. Now that I've tapped two of the pins in opposite corners, the entire set of jumpers will stay there until I, I finish soldering all the rest of the pins. So it's not the typical Windows OS once it's done. No, actually, um, the, the RAM and ROM board that's on it, um, this is one of the RAM ROM boards that I have. Uh, and the, that's a RAM chip there. That's 512K, 512 kilobytes, half a megabyte of actual RAM. And that's, uh, that's just its, like its total working RAM. It can't actually access all 512K at one time. It can only do it in like 32K chunks. Um, the empty slot just above it here is for the ROM. The ROM is 128K. The ROM includes a basic operating system or a CPM operating system. So you can actually boot it up and it runs like a basic command prompt or a CPM prompt. A CPM, uh, CPM was the precursor to MS-DOS. So if I run CPM on this, it, it looks a lot like DOS, operates like DOS. Um, CPM can actually access the compact flash card that's actually in the center of the board here. <laughs> that's too small. Um, surprisingly enough, you can do a whole lot in half a megabyte. Uh, and uh, honestly, those things are a lot of fun. There, there's so many things you can get them to do. So I'm going to go ahead and finish the rest of the pins on this header, get those soldered in, clean off my soldering iron. How long have I been streaming? Uh, Twitch says a little over two hours. Yeah, that's not bad. I think for the first 10 minutes, nobody was here. <laughs> heat up the pin, pop a little solder on it. Heat up the pin, pop a little solder on it. Heat up the pin, pop a little solder on it. You never want to actually like just heat up the solder and try to put it on there because the solder won't stick to the cold pin, or it won't stick very well. 
to heat up the pin once the pin gets hot enough to melt the solder the solder flows right into it and stays all right so now i've got that header pin header unfortunately this camera won't focus that close but there's a pin header there Since this pin header will use one jumper to select one of the addresses, I'll just leave one on there for now. All right, let's see what we got. Solder in a three pin jumper over here. And this is gonna be a little bit of a pain in the ass, so. I'm going to hold this in with my fingers and try not to burn myself. There we go. Great thing about uh, solder as a coil is it's flexible. You can actually position it in place so you don't need an extra hand to hold the solder. You just bring the board right up to the solder and that tends to work in most cases. And then I'll just straighten those connector pins out, make sure they sit correctly. And then I'll just solder in the other two pins on there. And off the soldering iron tip. And there's a jumper by the video port. I'm not sure which jumper, what jumper four is for. Well, if I go back to the schematic, eh, where'd the schematic go? Um, eh, where's the schematic, guys? So, I am from Seattle. Yes, I, I currently live in Seattle. Um, I've been living in Seattle this time around for a year and a half, year and three quarters. Um, originally from LA, I uh, grew up in Southern California, but I've lived lots of places around the country. And uh, Seattle happens to be where I live now. And uh, yes, I am employed by Microsoft, or at least I will be for another week. Um, my current contract is ending with them, and so I have to find some other work. And that's one downside about contract support. So when you work for Microsoft under managed services, you get to work for 18 months on, and then you have to take six months off. It is so that they don't have to treat you like a full-time employee, even though you are pretty much doing everything like a full-time employee. What kind of work? I, I do systems administration support. Um, currently I'm doing support for Microsoft Exchange Online in the Office 365 environment. Um, so helping large scale customers with their Exchange Online uh, administration and management, uh, providing support, fixing their problems when they blow something, something up in their environment, uh, recovering screwed up mailboxes, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, that the job is pretty easy. Um, I've been a systems administrator for a really long time uh, at other locations, so I'm, I'm really familiar with the entire Microsoft ecosystem. And yes, I, I am definitely familiar with Linux and all the other operating systems as well. I have a whole lot of Raspberry Pis. Um, Raspberry Pis, I have a Linux server. I'm definitely not uh, a one-trick Microsoft pony. Get some of these other headers soldered in here. Hey, Bent. Bent like it's makers in the house. Welcome. 
Love the Hebo in the background. Yes, this this Hebo, this monster. Um, actually, let me get this browser off my screen here. Um, that is a 300 by 300 by 550 vertical Hebo. Um, the vertical supports are actually 800 millimeter. Um, it's tall. And it is in progress. I've got the wires uh, for all the motors finally done. Um, everything's the correct length and measured out. I just need to run the wires. Um, and I was actually testing it uh, to make sure all the motors were operating correctly. And they are, thankfully, all operating correctly. Here's a, this is a pancake extruder motor that I'm using for the Bontech BMG um, geared extruder. Um, this is a Lin Engineering 0 0.9 degree super high torque pancake motor. These things are phenomenally smooth. They're also expensive. This one stepper was $48. However, I wanted to build a really nice Hebo. I didn't want to skimp on it, so all my steppers are actually high quality, super, super nice steppers. Um, the ones lifting the Z axis, there's a dual Z on it. Um, steppers back here where my finger is pointing. Um, those are super high torque, uh, very strong 1.8 degree NEMA 17 motors. Um, and thankfully the, the Duet Wi-Fi board um, has the 2660 drivers on it that can actually crank out 2.8 amps, although it's limited to like 2.4 in software. Um, but those motors, the, the Z motors, only use two amps uh, max each. I think they do two. Oh, yeah. No, they are two amp motors. Yeah, I may do one yet, need a large format machine. That's, that's exactly what this is. This is for larger, like, printing out super large enclosures or printing out prop pieces, printing out bigger things that I can actually put like a larger nozzle on and just blast out a huge piece really quickly. Uh, or even a high quality piece in, you know, days worth of printing. <laughs> um, so in addition to a 3D printing event, um, I'm actually putting together a video card for my, my scratch built 8-bit eight, uh, eight computer. Um, this is a, an 8-bit video card kit um, similar to what you would see in a, a ColecoVision or a Sega uh, SG-1000 or a TI-99 4A computer. Um, in fact, here is the actual computer itself with some of the boards that I've put together. Um, the CPU board was all wired by hand, and it does work. The CPU board I tested. The actual motherboard is a passive backplane that's, that's wired and all the boards plug right into it. That's that's one of the side projects, and I just got this kit in the mail today, so uh, I'm putting it together, at least while I got the chance. Um, I've also got a kit for a sound card. Um, that's uh, it's an AdLib OPL sound card uh, kit um, that I've got to put together for that as well. Which kit do I have? I don't have that board in here yet. I've got that board somewhere else, so I'll put that in eventually. But right now I'm actually finishing up getting all the, the jumpers soldered in. I'm actually really close to finishing this board. And let's see here. And actually while, while, uh, while I'm doing this in the background, I've got my, my uh, Mendel Max 3 printing out some Star Trek board game pieces for a friend of mine in some white pet G, which uh, I've got here. Uh, and I've got them printing nice and slow so that the, the detail on them is really nice. You just got in, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you got eight kilograms. Uh, you got eight of those one kilo spools um, for really cheap, I saw. I think you posted that in the Discord. Let's get this solder going here. Get that soldering iron cleaned off. And 
get these pieces soldered up. Got those jumpers and I have two more sets of jumpers to install and then I have to install the 40 pin, actually this is an 80 pin connector. Um, I'll pull some pins out. Um, this is the interface that actually couples with the the board here, the, the motherboard, the main passive backplane. Um, and that includes the 16-bit the address bus, the 8-bit data bus, and some control lines. And uh, unfortunately, I need, I need to pull some pins out of this to make it fit, because uh, this is a full 2 by 40 and these boards actually only have second row in like one short spot. Need the heat resistance going over a heat vent. Oh, you know, I actually haven't really put a lot of testing into the heat resistance of my, my pet G other than, well, okay, that's not true. Um, in fact, I will swap over right now to my printer. Um, you can see here in my printer that I've got going the these white mounting blocks on the on the corner of the bed. Those white blocks are actually uh, this this exact same roll of white pet G or no maybe it was a previous roll of white pet G, and they've been run with that heat bed on it all four corners up to 120 C and they have not deformed at all. Um, and that's the hottest I've used the pet G at and and it's fantastic. Um, it's 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 remained really strong. Not had a problem with it. Um, when I bought the bed upgrade for that printer, and it came with the the base plate on that bed. Let's see if you can see it. Um, there's the glass that's on top, and right underneath the glass, there's a red uh, aluminum heat spreader that the the bed heater is is stuck to, and that floats on those four corners. And underneath the four corners where all the, the actual motion is mounted, where the wheels are mounted, is an aluminum plate. It's like a three millimeter thick aluminum plate. Super sturdy, uh, very, very nice plate. Um, great upgrade uh, compared to the original steel plate that came with it. Um, but the, the corner clips that it came with were actually an ABS. And they were not a good ABS, they were a cheap ABS. So I, I got it all together and I printed like three things out and the entire bed was just completely out of alignment because all four corners had melted. Um, and they, they didn't like completely melt, they just sagged substantially. And uh, I, I emailed the, the company about it. I said, hey, you guys included some really bad ABS um, corner mounts with these. And they're like, oh yeah, sorry, we actually we accidentally had a batch of ABS go out. They should have been a higher higher temperature um, ABS, a better ABS, and I was like, you know what? Just forget it. I'll, I'll just take the, uh, I'll take the STL files and I'll print them out myself. So I got those printed myself. Um, and the white pet G, it's just the, it's just the hatch box and the, uh, um, right up here behind me on top, it's uh, a one kilo hatch box pet G from Amazon, twenty bucks a roll U.S. Dirt cheap. It's worked. Um, in fact, I've got these optical end stop mounts. Um, all of, in fact, if you look at my my Hevo, my HyperKey Bevo here, all of the mounts here are all white PET G. Um, although these haven't been in an enclosure running for any period of time, so I haven't actually tested. I haven't run those very hot yet. The carriage up there, all the motor mounts, everything there is this white, super strong PET G. Uh, fantastic stuff. Excuse me. Oh yeah, in fact, um, for this 8-bit computer, um, one of the expansion boards that I, I have kit pieces for is actually an expansion board for this. It's a um, this is a floppy drive, just a standard three, three and a half inch floppy drive. Um, and it's, it provides a standard Western Digital 8-bit floppy controller on a card, so I can actually mount standard floppy disks and run those with the CPM operating system. And 
that's another project. In fact, actually, these are the chips for the sound card. Um, that'll be another day. Yeah, PETG is great if it's dry. Actually, I have found that the Hatchbox PETG is okay wet. In fact, this roll that I have um, in the enclosure right now has been in 40 to 50% humidity for about a month without being sealed. Um, and it's still printing, like it, it, it's printing nice. Um, I do notice that I am having an issue with some of it sticking to the nozzle. Printer's going through a slow part on the print. Um, I, I have, um, it, when, it's, when it's been wet, it's actually been sticking to the nozzle and some of it globs up underneath the nozzle, but um, it's not really that bad for the most part. Uh, if I print slowly without a bunch of super jerky movements or long movements, it, it has no problem at all. Hatchbox makes really good filament. Yeah, surprisingly enough, for the price, the filament is good. Um, overall, Hatchbox filament is still cheap filament. Um, it works for the most part. Um, I wouldn't say it's great filament. It's definitely not $40 filament. Um, it's not atomic filament. It's not, <laughs> you know, it, it, it it's good for the price, uh, and I definitely have quite a bit of it. Um, but I also have a lot of really nice filaments. I, I have a bunch of stuff from Filament One. Um, I have some MG Chemicals filament, which surprisingly is MG Chemicals filament works pretty well. Oh. And now my printer's doing something funny. find some of it has a lot of retract sometimes it will still extrude yeah you know uh, surprisingly enough this this batch hasn't actually sucked up a lot of moisture um, usually uh, like I have some rolls of ABS that just didn't survive one day out of the box um, just sucked up so much so much water and you could actually hear it you could see steam you could hear it popping and of course it would jam like mad um, and uh, honestly, for the most part, I've stopped printing with PLA, even though I still have a lot of PLA here to print with, but uh, the PETG has been working out really, really good. Thankfully, now I have $19 PETG before it was 40 a kilo, unless you subscribed. Oh, yeah, the, the this PETG I bought, it was 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, I think it's fluctuated a little bit, like between 20, 25, sometimes 30. Um, but I have, every time it's 20, I'll buy a couple of rolls. <sighs> All right. Yeah, and there, there is a little bit of filament sticking to, sticking to the nozzle right now, but it doesn't seem to. Oh, and you're out, Ben. All right, thanks for stopping by. Uh, see you another night, man. So it looks like I got five viewers on. That's pretty good. Been on for about two and a half hours, um, and that is that's quite a bit, 
quite a long time. Um, in fact, I got a couple of jumpers still here to solder in to get these things done before my soldering iron gets super corroded from sitting there on. And then go through the tedious task of actually pulling out the extra pins on the, the large right angle connector that will, it's the bus connector. Boy, that was a whole lot of solder. There we go. Clean off the, clean that off, get these reheated. Okay, I can solder these pins down. Need a hand there? Yeah, I, I totally need. So I need extra hands. Um, although with these jumpers, it's it's not that difficult to just stick the solder up to do that. All right. So those are all the jumpers. And I will set the set the iron aside for a few minutes. And what I've got to do here is this strip. It's it's dual row. There's there's dual rows of 40 pins, and I got to pull out a whole buttload of them to actually fit in this thing. So I need to mark off which ones I need to pull out. Starting here, oh, actually that came out pretty easy. I am happy with that. I do want them to just slide out. I don't want the, the header row to snap off because these are actually quick snap headers. You can snap off as many pieces as you need. I don't want to really do that. See if I can squeeze them out. Yeah, but not so easily. Get them on. So, oh wow, actually, we're down to two viewers down in chat. So it looks like um, Mudiab, if you're still there. Hope I'm not butchering your name. And uh, actually, looks like it's just Muriyab and one of the bots. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around. I appreciate it. And uh, of course, now this, that's going to fit in there a little bit easier. Because I've got the top row of pins out on this side. And uh, the top row of pins will stay in in this little center section. It's like 10 pins long. And then the top row of pins over here I'm about to pull out. Uh, I needed to align it here to see which pin I needed to start yanking. And I can start yanking right there. Come on out. Come on out. Er. Oof, 
two hours, 36 minutes. That was more than I was expecting, but that's cool. Um, definitely keeping my stream time up. And with electronics projects like this, it's real easy to spend an awful lot of time um, just because there's so many little tedious details. Um, but honestly, I enjoy the work. I was going to be doing it anyway, so I might as well record. Okay. So now I've actually got that in place. And I forgot some of the uh, some of these smaller style blue boards that they've got are actually 39 pin. So I just want to verify, make sure I'm doing this right. Pretty darn sure I'm doing that right. And they they made them 39 pin because. Uh, they, the boards fit a certain form factor for these smaller boards, and that's cool if you're going to buy one of the pre-made RC2014 kits. Um, but as I built one myself, um, I actually picked these really nice large green cards. Uh, it's, they're super cheap on Amazon. You can get like a whole box of them. I think I have maybe, I think I have maybe a dozen of them. I got for like ten or fifteen bucks um, for these nice boards. Um, and they're all they're all a pretty nice big fat form factor. So I will continue using those. But of course, these smaller boards they, they totally fit in on this as well, because um, it is using the same same bus as uh, the actual pre-made kits. So, all right, let's get some of this soldered down. That actually looks pretty straight, surprisingly, first time around. So I'll go ahead and solder down all the rest of the pins on this. And that'll be done for the night. Unfortunately, there's an awful lot of pins on this one. It's uh, soldering 50, 50-ish pins. So this will take a few minutes. Thankfully, these pre-made PC boards actually make the process of building these boards a whole lot quicker um, compared to actually like this board that I have back here. Um, all the wiring I had to cut, you know, I had to cut individual wire to length and route those correctly um, completely by hand. And that, like, I, that board took me two weeks to build um, versus, you know, something like this that the traces are already on the board. You just have to solder in the components and that, you know, it's, it's an evening build, two hours instead of two weeks. Um, but knowing that I actually have the skill to solder this up and surprisingly enough, it actually ran the first time I soldered it up. Uh, that was, that was nice. It was really good that I was actually able to do that. All right, so what do we got? We got 20, 25, come on, pins, get through these suckers.
definitely going through a lot of my solder. Um, this project, just all the different solder points. How much did you spend on Mendel back there, including the upgrades? Um, the the Mendel Max 3, when I bought it, um, it was brand new. Um, the company had just released the, the version 3 kit. And the kit itself, the complete kit, was like fourteen or $1,500. And I didn't have quite that much to spend, so um, I bought the Motion Kit, which is everything but the electronics. And um, I actually saved money on my own electronics. Initially, it actually had a ramps board in it, and it printed okay with a ramps board, um, but it wasn't the best printing quality. Um, and then I upgraded it actually to a smoothie board. It's got a smoothieware board in there now. Um, and it, it's got a smoothieware clone board in there now, unfortunately. Uh, the clone boards use the TI-8825 drivers, and those 8825 drivers are not the best quality drivers, um, which is why actually this control board that I have over here is in testing to replace the board that's in there because the the TMC trinamic drivers that are in this board here are fantastic, very smooth drivers, really good print quality, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I spent, I think the motion kit was seven ninety nine or eight ninety nine somewhere around there, and that's all the extrusions, all the the steel plates, all of the V slot wheels. Um, the extruder head and uh, adding electronics into it, I spent maybe around a thousand or eleven hundred dollars. So I, I did save money and have a, a working printer, um, but then I bought an upgrade. Um, I upgraded the the bed to their their newer style bed, and that was. I think it was 80 bucks, so that's almost $1,200 right there total. And um, by the time actually I bought the bed, the Mendel Max 3 kit had been reduced in price, and I think now you can get them for around 1,100 complete. Um, and there's even a, a third, up, uh, further upgrade for the Mendel Max that they're just about to release that replaces all the V slot wheels with linear rail, but that's a $400 kit. And it looks like that print is having an issue at the very end. So we will kill that one off for just a moment. Most of the parts came out fine. Uh, so yeah, um, I had considered buying the linear rail upgrade for that kit. Um, it actually, in fact, the linear rail kit requires that you have a later model Mendel Max 3. Um, later on in the production, they actually, the Z, uh, the extrusions, the vertical extrusions for the Z are a little bit taller in the later model, so you get a little bit more height out of it. And the, the linear rail kit requires the taller ones, so they offer those for like an extra eight bucks if you don't have the the later model Mendel Max. Um, it replaces uh, the X carriage that's in there now is a twenty by sixty. Um, it's like three twenty by twenty extrusions side by side type of setup, um, and that's that's really heavy uh, for the most part. Um, it also includes like a lighter extruder body so that there's less motion um, and it's it's a nice upgraded system it's just it's four hundred dollars plus tax and shipping that i just don't have um, so honestly yeah with all the upgrades that they've offered for that you could spend easily two thousand dollars on it um, the good thing is it's been really reliable like even with the V-slot wheels, they're, they're polyurethane wheels running on uh, aluminum V-slot extrusion. That stuff works just fine. It's been working for years. Um, I've had that printer going for three, three and a half years, and it just works. 
Um, honestly, the only maintenance I really have to do to it is cleaning hairspray off the bed every now and then, or reapplying a new layer, and changing out nozzles because the nozzles wear out. Um, really, that's the only maintenance I do for it. Um, hopefully I get the, the hypercube here into a state where it's, it's as solid as that and maintenance is really low. Um, the great thing about the hypercube, uh, it's hard to see up here, see it on camera, the X carriage here that runs on these two rods, um, it's modular. This, the, there's a plate here with holes in it um, for registration pins and a center screw. You can actually take a print head and literally set it on there, screw one screw in the back, and you know that's your print head. Um, I could actually re replace that print head with a laser module or a different style of print head, like a larger flow volcano print head um, with like a 0.8 or a one millimeter nozzle just to, to get a lot of plastic out. Um, I want this thing to be nice and flexible and functional in, in the best way possible. And it's, it's taken me, um, I started buying parts for this and putting it together towards the beginning of 2018. So it's taken me most of the year to get to this point. Um, and I, since I built it myself, uh, it's probably, it's probably around a thousand dollars in parts. Um, yeah, it's about $1,000 in parts, and quite honestly, that kind of build for $1,000 is fantastic. Um, one of the most expensive parts is this control board. Um, the Duet Wi-Fi control board is like $170 US. Um, that's, that's quite a lot of money. Um, however, these things have really nice Trinamic 2660 drivers on them, and they, they print really well. Uh, I have somewhat same thing, two rods, an extrusion, a couple of fans on it, yeah. Um, honestly, for 3D printing, a lot of it is the same type of parts. Um, the Mendel Max in the corner, the Hypercube here, they're all using aluminum extrusion. Um, aluminum extrusion, this one has rods and ball screws. Um, the Z-axis here, these are actually ball screws. Um, very high precision. I, I got these from Ziltec. Uh, in Texas. Um, so uh, since they're ball screws, there's no slack in them. Uh, the motion is extremely smooth, but each of those screws was 50 bucks. Um, and there are people that have replaced the, the rods that are on it with uh, linear rail. Uh, and the linear rail mod actually raises up the carriage a little bit higher and gives you a little bit more Z-room. Um, but for the the linear rail that I would need for this, I would probably need to spend uh, probably close to two or three hundred dollars in linear rail. And I really don't want to do that when this setup actually works really well. Um, those rods are, are hardened chrome steel. Um, they don't flex. They are they are super strong. Um, oh yeah, so back to what I was doing um, after that thing started freaking out. Um, I get these the rest of these solder joints finished up. And just about done with those, which is great because my wife just went to bed and she probably wants me to go to bed too, so I stopped making noise. <laughs> yeah, the soldering iron and shut that off and that's it. That's actually the completed board. Uh, the only thing I need to do really is 
populate all the chips and I need to get the reference page for that so I know which chips are going where other than the big ones I mean the larger chips here there's the RAM and the actual video processor RAM inserted there. This RAM actually looks like a, a newer chip. Yeah, it's got a date code of 2004, so it's probably never been used in anything. It's probably just a lot of old stock. Let's see if I can get these pins bent straight. Usually ICs, when they come, the pins are bent slightly outward. Um, for manufacturing reasons. Of course, it makes it pain in the ass when you do it by hand. Just want to be careful not to overbend them. There we go. So there's the RAM in its socket. And then we'll go ahead with the video processor. Actually, this one has its leads bent straight out too. It doesn't look like it's actually been never used in anything. This might actually be new old stock. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's getting late. Yeah, it is getting late. <laughs> Which is why I am finishing this up. There's the TMS chip, and HCT574, which are the bigger, bigger monsters. Uh, that's the 574. There's three of those. Well, it actually looks like all of these chips are new. That's kind of nice. A lot of chip kits you find for older older machines like this, older computer styles, the, the chips tend to be pulled out of older machines and some of them have actually been soldered before instead of socketed, which is kind of a pain. Because the soldered ones, the pins, there's usually a little bit of solder left over on them. I'm just using the straight edge of the table to bend all these pins at once. Make it nice and easy. My viewer count has fluctuated substantially. Okay, let's see. I got 74HCT32, 74HCT04, and a 74HCT138. Uh, the 138 is the larger out of those, so that's the one that goes over here. Two of these chips are 14 pin, and one of them 16 pin, so it's really easy to, to tell where the 16 pin goes. And that 16 pin chip is used as the decoder for the I.O. port, where that's actually being selected uh, to activate the chip when the CPU communicates with it. And now I just need to look through the documentation here and verify which chips go where. The one over here is the 04. So the 04N, we're gonna have to bend those two. Which means that chip up in the corner
<laughs> I don't have a great picture of it, actually. All of their pictures are a little blown out. There's a reflection, so you can't actually read what's on the chip, but I believe this is for the 132. If not, I'll find out when I try to turn it on and it doesn't work. All right. So I've got a jumper here in this corner and I'll put it on an empty slot. I've also got a jumper here that I'll put on an empty slot just sitting on one pin so it's not connecting anything. Uh, same thing over here. Empty pin there, empty pin there, you got an empty pin there. And that's it. That's uh, not that the camera's fantastic on there, but that's the completed RS 9918 video card board for an RS 2014, or sorry, RC 2014 uh, style computer. Uh, it's getting very late, and I am absolutely done, so thank you for hanging out. Thank you for everybody that stopped by. Thank you for everybody that's actually going to watch later on YouTube, if anybody does. Um, thanks to all the guys that uh, came here from uh, Filament Central. Really appreciate that. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and on YouTube and Twitch. On Twitch, I am Duo Dreamer. On YouTube, I'm Duo Dream, without the ER. Uh, on Twitter, um, I am twitter.com slash Randy Mongenel, which I'll put in the chat. Oh, and actually I'll probably throw that in on the description on the, on the video link. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, thanks Moody Yeb for sticking around for so long. Um, thank you for subscribing. Hope you see some of my other videos as well and uh, have a good night.